This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek Radio, and I'm with Bob Carnegie, who's the chair uh, of the MUA branch in Queensland, which includes Brisbane, and he's visiting the United States to build solidarity with American workers and talk about this, this struggle in Australia as well. So welcome, Bob. So, Bob, why don't you talk about how you became active in your union and your experiences? Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. I became active as a of course, as a as a young seafarer in the old Seamen's Union of Australia, and in 1993 we merged with the Waterside Workers Federation and became the Maritime Union of Australia. I started off as a as a, a young active rank and filer who believed uh, in uh, in democratic trade unionism. Uh, I became very active around social and industrial causes. In 1985, I was uh, arrested 11 times on picket lines supporting uh, electrical workers who had been sacked in Queensland. I got jailed for uh, for 21 days in maximum security um, in a maximum security jail in in Brisbane. Um, and uh, from then on, I just tried to be a, a good, honest trade union militant. Um, Eventually, I was uh, appointed as a as the uh, an honorary president, a non paid position in my union. I relieved an office a lot, and eventually, uh, in 1993, I was elected as the assistant secretary of the Maritime Union branch organizer in in Queensland. Well, the issue of democracy, uh, the a lot of unions have become corporatized. Many of them are uh, mimic kind of top down structure of corporations and multinationals. you have the same problem in Australia? Yeah, we have exactly the same problem. In fact, uh, I guess at one stage of my life, um, I sort of, I paid too much attention to top-down structures and eventually I, um, I completely broke with that. The only way that trade unions are going to, uh, to really be a part of the, 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 uh, the cornerstone of the working class struggle is if they're, genuine bottom-up organisations. Top-down organisations do not work for unions well because they isolate the key people in the union, which are the rank and file. And your union, the MUA, is uh, perhaps the most militant union in Australia. Um, what kind of attack has it faced uh, by companies, uh, the multinational shipping companies and stevedoring companies? Well, the MUA is one of the most militant unions in the country. I'd probably say that the CFMEU, uh, the uh, construction uh, union, would probably be the most militant at the present time, but certainly the MUA is up there. The uh, uh, What's happened particularly, it, it's in two areas. The seafaring area has been... Um, fundamentally abandoned by uh, Australian capital and the Australian government and so it's been left to wither on the vine. Today there's only 14 Australian merchant ships so there's now mass unemployment amongst Australian seafarers. So on one hand they've been able to deal the union a mighty blow by simply divest, uh, disinvesting in the industry. Um, it, most Australian seafarers are, are involved in the offshore oil and gas industry and uh, there's a powerful move by this conservative government that we have at the, uh, that's just been re-elected to uh, have a situation where they'll be excluded from any work within the offshore oil industry and they'll be replaced by uh, by foreign labour that'll be paid anything anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of what an Australian seafarer earns. And the um, Australian Labor Party. Uh, has been supported by most of the unions in Australia. What has been the role of the Australian Labor Party in Australia and, and its role in the working class? Well, I have a, a different spin on the Australian Labor Party than most other trade union leaders in the country. I think that the Australian Labor Party is fundamentally a, another party of the capitalist... Is, is a party of the capitalist system. To a degree, it's Tweedledum and Tweedledee. The, I often have said, and I, I know this sounds a little bit flippant, and it is, but um, the only difference between the Conservatives and the Labor Party to some degree is that under a Labor Party, workers have tended to get better redundancy pays. So uh, although the Labor Party has some, you know, some has more progressive uh, gen, um, uh, social, uh, more progressive social outlook than the Conservatives, uh, it uh, still believes in keep, keeping our, um, our uh, state-based uh, 
social health system called Medicare Alive, and it should be congratulated for that. In the end, um, for for working people in Australia, we've seen trade union density collapse under both Labor and under Conservative governments. And the United States plays an important role in Australia. They tried to they set up a base, apparently with the support of the government. They're pushing TPP. What is the role of the United States government and U.S. multinationals in Australia? Uh, look, it's all pervasive. The uh, the the role of uh, the U.S. in Australia, particularly since the Second World War and during the Second World War, has fundamentally uh, Australia is like a uh, a little bridesmaid after the uh, that rides on the U.S.'s coattails in both domestic and international. Uh, affairs. Australia has never misses a war that the US is involved in. In fact, it seems to break its neck trying to get involved in a war that the US is in so that we can sh uh, we can show uh, to the US how servile and how docile the Australian people are and the Australian governments are to uh, serve their uh, interests. As far as US uh, transnationals and their and their penetration in the Australian economy. It's been absolutely massive, uh, particularly in uh, the cultural sphere now, where uh, American ads, for example, uh, are shown on our TVs. Um, and the uh, I think the the American cultural, the American uh, communication transnationals have been have played a very very powerful role in. Uh, uh, in the in the um, in the Australian in changing the Australian culture, and what would be the effect of Trans Pacific Partnership if it passed in Australia? Oh, look, all 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 the Trans Pacific Partnership will do is fundamentally just impoverish the working class and make the transnationals even more unaccountable to governments and what they are now, so that they won't even be uh, accountable to uh, to the courts of the land. We had just had a a very uh, recent case of one of the. Uh, largest tobacco, uh, I think it was Philip Morris, a, a huge uh, American uh, tobacco company. I think they're part of the Reynolds Group. And uh, we, they took the Australian government to court in Singapore to a tribunal under one of the under the World Trade Organisation because in Australia we've had a very powerful campaign against cigarette smoking. In Australia, uh, a packet of 20 cigarettes, for example, is about 25 US dollars, and we have very st strong packaging on, that shows uh, the effects of cigarette smoking and with cancer and whatever. And uh, Reynolds, uh, uh, Philip Morris, took us to uh, took us to the uh, tribunal in Singapore about uh, about it. So, a transnational can take a government to court over over law over something that's quite justifiable it's it's horrific what they you know these these uh like corporations are fundamentally fascistic organizations they're not elected but they they've got more powers than the courts and governments of, of your land under these tpp arrangements uh, chomsky's uh, spoken out about them and you know he talks about them just in the same way that uh, they're unelected they um uh, unaccountable and they're they're not secret deals, but the deals are only known to corporate lawyers because corporate lawyers are the ones that are drafting the legislation for these TPPs. And what has been the effect of privatisation and deregulation in Australia? Well, privatisation and deregulation, of course, had a, has had an enormous effect. It's had an enormous effect on uh, trade union density, which is which often isn't discussed about in the effects of privatisation. Uh, people talk about the broad effects, but in the... Uh, in the public sphere, there is always far higher trade union density, even in this country, even in the United States. In Australia, it's the same. You privatise a corporation, you open it up to uh, all, the, all the open forces of, of the market, and uh, that means that you open it up to, uh, to a deregulated labour market, which, has had a, uh, which is um, enormously um, telling on the workers that are involved. It's meant that... Uh, where, where it's come about, it's meant that workers have, in the end, um, lost conditions of employment. Uh, it's meant that uh, workers have, uh, workers' lives become more, their working life becomes more precarious, more unstable. Uh, and it has had, on a social level, it has a, even a bigger effect. Like when you 
privatise, for example, in Victoria, they privatised the power industry. Well, privatising the power industry for an uh, for a Victorian has been a disaster because it's meant that uh, huge transnational uh, utilities charge exactly what they want. And so they charge a lot more for electricity in Victoria than what they would if it was st a state-owned, uh, accountable organisation. Now, the, the capitalists in the United States and Australia, all over the world, want more temporary workforce as needed, part-time. And you've talked somewhat in the past about making workers trust. You have independent contractors in the United States who want everybody to be an independent contractor uh, with no seniority, no protection. How is uh, this working out in Australia? Well, look, there's uh, several ways it's working out, but the, the most obvious and most pervasive one is through labour hire. Uh, labour hire in Australia just means that a worker is picked up on a day basis. It's used very heavily in construction, uh, in mining, in many other industries, and uh, it's had a very pervasive effect on trade union militancy, but also on, on workers' wages. We have situations in the mining, coal mining industry where workers on a, a labour hire agreement might be on 40% less than a, than a union contracted coal miner and it creates divisions amongst workers, it creates jealousies and it creates the perfect atmosphere for the, uh, for the employer to drive down the conditions of, of, the, uh, of the worker who's on a collective agreement. Now, the kind of reigning ideology of most unions around the world is business unionism. Uh, basically, you know, it's, it's a business and getting contracts is the major responsibility of unions. What's your view of business unionism and, and the future for the labor movement if it is to survive this uh, economic crisis and attacks on basic rights? Yeah, look, Steve, that's a very good question because it's one that uh, I think um, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of very good, honest trade union leaders, um, but I think this pervasive ideology of this business unionism uh, is one that even um, uh, permeates through even some very good, honest union leaders. It's a bad. It's it's a, an ideology that means that the bricks and mortar of the organisation is more important than its soul. Trade unions are fundamentally organisations that were that should be oppositionist by nature. A trade union should not um, uh, be a part of uh, or go into too many deals or any deals with any other organisation apart from its rank and file or with other other trade unions. This idea that uh, the only important thing is that you collect dues, you look at the bank account grow uh, and all's good in the union is a recipe for absolute disaster. No one's saying that uh, you know unions should um, live in under a, a tent or anything like that. But what I believe in is that union uh, dues are, are, should be expended on things that will make them grow and things that will um, will inspire workers to, to want to do better and inspire workers to, to, to feel that they're part of something, not just, not just a, a nameless organisation that they pay X amount of dollars a week to. And you've raised this issue at a national convention about expenditures. Why don't you talk about what happened? Oh, yeah. Look, at uh, at the uh, National Convention of the Maritime Union, I spoke about the uh, the fact that maybe we should cut down on some of our expenses rather than raising dues. It wasn't exactly the most uh, popular uh, debate that I've ever been involved in, but what do you do if you feel strongly about something? You should raise it, and uh, uh, there's not a force on this earth that will um, shut me up. Uh, so they'd have to put me in a in a in a coffin before I will shut up about things that I believe strongly about. And what was the response to that? Well, I think the response is probably is that uh, it's far easier to to raise union dues than it is to cut costs, uh, particularly unnecessary costs. Um, but any organisation has to realise that if if you have a lot of fat on it, you have to trim that. And uh, we all always have to be mindful as a workers' leader that. You know, any place you might go or anything that you do is that you're doing it on the dime of the of members' dues, and that has to be right up in front of your mind all the time. Now, there's a general global attack on labor um, in every country of the world, uh, including in China and the workers there. Um, 
what, why hasn't the labor movement responded internationally? Why haven't there been international actions? And why doesn't labor have a medium, a communication medium, to get its stories out of struggles like in the MUA or struggles in the United States uh, that are happening of workers? It seems like they're very isolated and workers don't know about them worldwide. Look, Steve, one of the things that I've been hugely impressed about in the Labor Fest that uh, you kindly invited me to is that the the whole idea of workers being able to communicate and spread their message is one that's absolutely vital. Unions tend to be quite slow-moving, lumbering beasts, and really we have to change that. If we're going to be a part and an important and an important part of of the 21st century world, we have to adapt and to utilise modern technology for the benefit of rank and file workers. Now, I understand, but I don't agree with um, the position that a lot of trade union leaders have about organisations uh, like Facebook. Or they're, they're afraid of this? Yeah, this, they are. Whereas, why be afraid of, of something? Look... It's there. You have to. Why don't you utilise it to try to get your message across? You will not. You won't ever get a hundred percent support, but that's fine too. People, and people do have a right to speak their mind. Um, some people, you know, there's always trolls anywhere in in any organisation. Um, we certainly can't as trade. Union, if anyone thinks as a trade union leader, they can prevent um, uh, the social media from getting uh, getting out there. Isn't it more important to participate in it? and to be a, a moving force of it rather than just be reactive to it all the time and complain about it. And what do you see the future for international labour media communications? Well, the future has to be one where we uh, really work hard to be able to get the message of the rank-and-file workers' struggle out to workers everywhere. Uh, you, uh, Steve, I was very appreciative of you explaining to me about uh, only last week you thought it was a good idea that uh, the MUA in Queensland put together a, a short video, a short YouTube video about some of the battles we've been in. Uh, I didn't know what to do, I'm a techno uh, technology dunce, but uh, a couple of phone calls, we were able to get uh, uh, a good little video done up uh, and the total cost of it to the union was a couple of hundred dollars It's and it's all around the world now, so it's it's a wonderful thing. Now, the United States, the Obama administration, both Democrats and Republicans have been pushing for what they call the Asian pivot, and that includes uh, militarization, more bases in Okinawa, new base in, in Jeju in Korea, and they have a, a base apparently that they put in Australia without the consultation of the Australian people. What do you see as uh, the relationship of this Asian pivot to the working class in Australia and Asia. Look, wherever, look, the U.S. doesn't put bases just um, for um, for their own defence. It's also uh, uh, a way to, you know, in a very sublime form, to intimidate the uh, intimidate uh, nations too. Like they've put a base in Darwin. I don't know whether there was much public debate about it in Australia. I certainly missed it if there was. Uh, so they've just gone about and you know, as the as the U.S. military does, it you know just does what it wants around the uh, around the world to a degree. But um, as far as uh, Asia goes, Asia is the fulcrum of the manufacturing part of the world now. The labour movement around the world in the developed world has to pay massive attention to to the uh, to the embryonic Asian trade union movement. It has to pay and and expend resources to give genuine fighting unions in Asia and genuine fighting rank and file organisations in Asia as much support as it can because by giving those organisations support, they actually support themselves. Like, uh, it's far, far better for the uh, the United Auto Workers here to support the as much as they possibly can <coughs> the struggle to develop strong unions in, in Asia one is for uh, because it's the right and the most important thing. It's the right thing to do. But secondly, is that if the labour costs rise in Asia, it makes the it makes the 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 uh, the 
the the distance between an American's auto workers' wage and a, and an Asian auto workers' wage less. So the argument that uh, that the manufacturing base has to switch is is lessened. So there's that there's that part too. There's a self preservation argument you can also use. Now China plays a very important role. The United States is arming countries uh, around Asia to kind of <coughs> surround China. Um, at the same time, Hutchinson, uh, they're Chinese capitalists who are in Australia all over. What role does China, Chinese capital play in um, Australia? And uh, what do you think about the United States growing encirclement of China? Uh, one, uh, the second one first. The U.S. should be very careful about trying to encircle China. China's been around for 5,000 years. They have a very, they play a very long game on on things. I uh, don't think it's a really good idea to make China uh, feel uh, feel trapped. I would think that's a a, a a risky military and foreign policy strategy. Uh, the second uh, thing um, with regards to um, well, Chinese capital, Chinese, Hutchinson. Chinese, well, Chinese capital in Australia is, it, as the Chinese, uh, as the Chinese economy, to a degree, contracts. There is a lot of Chinese money around to invest in other parts of the world, and they're investing a lot of money in Australia, um, in areas such as uh, real estate, uh, in agricultural land. Um, and also the uh, Hutchison, which are a huge Chinese transnational owned by a guy by the name of Lee Ka Shing, who's worth about 40 billion US dollars. Hutchison are the biggest terminal operator in the world. Last year they, they moved over 91 million containers, 20 foot equivalents. The, uh, uh, what we've found with them is that uh, they're aggressive companies that uh, want a. Uh, a return on capital and will ruthlessly ruthlessly pursue it. So, uh, to be quite honest, they're uh, they're no better and no worse than U.S. capital. And this uh, growing xenophobia, blaming immigrants, uh, racism uh, in the United States and Europe with the migration, uh, is do you face the same situation in Australia? Uh, immigrant bashing and and growing uh, racist attacks on immigrants and minorities. Yes, we do. Uh, it's look, Australia has played uh, both governments, but particularly the Conservatives. But the Labor Party tumbled into it also. About uh, we have this ruthless policy in Australia that if any refugees try to enter the com- uh, country by boat, is that they're turned back or they're taking to detention centres in Nauru, which is a tiny little dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, or to a place called Manus Island, which is a hellhole at, on the southern tip of New Guinea. Uh, it's in total convention of the UN uh, rights of the uh, UN covenants on the rights of the refugee. Uh, we're in breach of international law, but the Australian government uh, does it anyway. They've created a, a type of xenophobia in the country with regards to uh, to uh, the right to refugees, and it's uh, it's a huge problem. There's a rise, there's a definitive rise in in uh, in uh, outlandish racism in Australia. We've just had a, a senator elected in my uh, province, state Queensland, called Pauline Hanson, Pauline Hanson from the One Nation Party. And it's just as it says, they want a one nation. And the one nation means they only want a white Australia. Uh, they, Aren't there a lot of indigenous people in Australia? Uh, yeah, there is a lot of indigenous people who are, who have a lifespan 25 years less than a, than a white person who suffer from some of the most horrible... Uh, uh, they certainly suffer from the worst health, the worst education, the worst social housing, the worst, uh, the worst factor of everything. Their incrimination rate is... Is um, is many 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 times the average white person's, but uh, you know the, the One Nation and other less enlightened Australians somehow b- blame the Indigenous people for the for the fact that uh, their lives aren't going too strongly at the present time. It's it's um, a very very um, weak and very racist argument. Now, 
the growing uh, wars, both the bombing by the United States of uh, Iraq, uh, bombing of Libya, uh, bombing of Syria has created millions of uh, refugees who are flooding into Europe to escape these wars. Uh, you have a growing threat of uh, another world imperialist war. What should be the situ uh, position of workers in Australia and around the world in the face of what seems to be a, a, a threat of, a, of another world imperialist war? Well, we have to oppose that, of course. It's just, it has to, it has to be uh, opposed. And the thing about refugees that people don't realise is that refugees are, uh, uh, are trying to get away from a war. They're not trying to um, get a free ride into uh, the United States or a free ride into Australia or to Europe, they're, they're fleeing a, a, a conflict not of their own making. They're trying to save their children from being murdered. Like, what in the world? It, it's what any of us would do for for children, for our families, for, for those that we love. It's just a normal human thing. And really, the world should be looking at the root causes of the problems and not uh, trying to blame poor refugees that are trying to um, trying to somehow get a new life for their families or wait out in safety until their their homelands are somehow uh, returned to uh, a place when they can go back with their with their families and what are the root causes of the problem the root causes of every problem is that uh, usually it's um, well it's it's the haves and the have nots it's somebody uh, it's uh, one section of society trying to oppress the other, or it might be an outside, an outside uh, force trying to uh, boost or uh, bolster their own uh, influence within a country. And the rise of Trump in the United States, uh, nationalism, uh, the solution is to put up a wall between Mexico and the United States. Uh, this ideology that nationalism can solve the problems for the American working class is, what do you think about that kind of ideology? Uh, look, Trump has, uh, Trump's a demagogue. Uh, he is, he, he, he delves into places that best are left alone or the best that a, uh, where a sociologist should be looking at, not a, not a uh, real estate uh, shark. Uh, the, um, his whole idea is to prey on the 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 fears and the broken dreams of the the poor white working class. That's how I see it, uh, and he's been effective at that. And so, when people have uh, have seen their jobs and their careers destroyed, and they're middle aged and they don't think that there's much chance of them working again, or the only jobs they're ever going to get are minimum wage. They want to lash out and blame anybody. Instead of lashing out and blaming the capitalist system, which has done it to them, they lash out and blame the easy marks, which are the poor Mexican or the uh, the poor uh, the poor black person, not the uh, not the root cause of the problem, which it, which is surprisingly the Donald Trumps of this world, the one percent, and. You visited uh, the United States, and what, as an Australian trade union leader and activist, uh, are your words to American working people? Look, the American working class, for me, uh, has been the great inspiration of my life, the, the, the history and the struggles that American workers have, have uh, involved themselves in has been the reason that I, as a young man, uh, become a a militant trade unionist uh, from the stories of people like Eugene Victor Debs, uh, uh, Sacco and Vincetti, Joe Hill, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, the Mother Jones, Big Bill Hayward. They were all larger than life characters that helped, um, for me, uh, show that even in the wealthiest country in the world, the, the the land of the Rockefellers and the Morgans and now the the Bill Gates and the Warren Buffetts is that the American worker still resists every day to try to build a better life 
for his and her family. And uh, for me, uh, even though trade unionism is in, in a low point historically at the present time, I believe that uh, what I've seen over the last few days is that uh, hope uh, hope is still there. Uh, I believe that if we can work together, Australian, American, Canadians, workers from every part of the world, uh, and particularly in Asia, is that we can we can change and turn things around. So you're optimistic? Yeah, of course. You have to be optimistic. I have a saying that uh, every day above the ground, you're still a chance, Steve.